Hey guys, how's it going? In this video, I'm gonna go through my bike setup for bike packing and bike touring. I'm gonna to talk about why I chose this particular bike and why I chose all the components to make it up. This video is not gonna be exactly a review of this particular bike, but more of a general roundup on what I think is important in choosing a bike for bike packing and bike touring, which I think will be more useful to most of you. If you are looking for a review of this particular bike, I have written one on my website and you can find the link in the description. This is actually the third bike that I've had for bike packing and by far my favorite. When I first started cycling around the world eight years ago, I rode a Surly Long Haul Trucker, which is a very conventional touring bike. That bike I rode for about 25,000 kilometers from New Zealand back to England and then all throughout Northern Europe for about two years. My second bike was a Surly ECR 29 Plus, which I rode from Northern Europe all the way down to the Middle East and then the entire length of Africa, throughout South America and then all around Europe over the course of the pandemic. And finally, I switched over to this bike, which I've had now for about two years. This bike has seen action in Europe, Africa, and North America. And most recently, I cycled it from Alaska down to Canada. The last thing I will say before I get started is that this is a very expensive bike and there are a lot of expensive components on it. For me, it's totally worth spending the money because this is what I do for a living. This is my life now. So it's worth my while to spend a bit more money for extra comfort. But it's very important, I think, to say that you absolutely don't need a bike this good to go bike packing. If you would like to try bike packing and bike touring, you'd want to go out on a bike adventure, but you're limited by funds, you've got a limited budget, and so you don't want to go spending thousands of dollars on a really high level bike. That is absolutely fine. You by no means need something like this. The great thing about bike travel is that you can get by on virtually anything. Even a very cheap secondhand mountain bike that you bought off some guy at the pub is going to work out just fine. It's not going to be as comfortable. You're probably going to have more mechanical issues, but you absolutely can get around the world on it. If you just want to try bike packing, my best suggestion would be just use whatever you've got. Most of you probably have an old bike lying around in your garage somewhere. Give it a service, get it running, and that will probably do you just fine, at least to start off with. And then if you decide it's something you want to commit to further, then getting something like this is definitely worth thinking about because it is going to make life a lot more comfortable for you. Okay, with that said, let's dive straight into the bike. The first thing I'm going to talk about with the bike is going to be the big elephant in the room, which is why a mountain bike? The question that I get asked most often by people looking at choosing a bike for bike packing or bike touring is what kind of bike to go for and why I have chosen something like this, which is a mountain bike frame. A lot of people ask if they can go bike packing on gravel bikes. Gravel bikes are super popular these days and a lot of people already have gravel bikes so they want to know whether they can go out bike touring on them. The answer is absolutely yes, you can go bike touring on just about any bike really. It all depends on what kind of riding you want to do. And one is not necessarily better than the other universally, it just depends on what you're doing with it basically. There's not going to always be a best solution. Generally you're looking at a compromise, especially on longer tours where you're going to do a lot of different types of riding you're gonna to have to find something that works best for you the majority of the time. You're not gonna have a bike that works best for you all the time, that's just not how it goes. So the main types of bikes that you could go for, there's a million different labels for these because bike companies love to make up new labels for their bikes as it helps sell them. But generally speaking, you've got road bikes, you've got gravel bikes, you've got touring bikes, you've got mountain bikes like this, and then you've got things like fat bikes. There's obviously a lot more than that, but those are the main, I would say, five categories that most people are gonna usually fall under when they're looking at bikes. So starting with a road bike, I would personally never tour on a road bike just because I like to ride off-road and road bikes aren't very good off-road, so that's pretty straightforward. Obviously, if you are looking at riding only on-road and you wanna go fast and far, then a road bike could be a good option for you. Not gonna to talk too much about that today because that's not really what I do. A touring bike is a great option as well. The limitation there is that they tend to be a little bit less capable for the off-road stuff. They tend to be a little bit heavier, a little bit overbuilt, but they are very comfortable. So in general, a touring bike can be a good option too. A gravel bike is a really good option if you wanna ride light off-road and you wanna go fairly fast, especially if you're pretty comfortable and married to the road bike sort of geometry and set up with drop bars. The limitation I find with gravel bikes is generally that they are a little bit less capable for riding the rowdiest stuff than a mountain bike. Especially if you want to ride single track, you'll pretty quickly hit the limitations with gravel bikes. You can still do the same stuff, probably. It's just going to be pretty rough. And at a certain point, it's just not really fun anymore because you're getting really beaten up. You're taking a lot of vibration. And so it's not really as fun. Then you have something like this, a mountain bike which is obviously designed for single track. So if you're gonna be riding more single track, rougher roads, rougher terrain in general, I would say a mountain bike is the way to go. The other option you could go with, which is sort of the far extreme end of the comfort roughness spectrum, 
is going to be something like a fat bike or even a mid fat bike like my Surly ECR that I was running which runs three inches or so tires as opposed to a fat bike which would be close to four or even five. Personally having ridden a three inch tire for a really long time and having looked into fat bikes extensively I don't think it's worth it for long-term touring for most people. The number of times when you really need the extra plush of the fat tire is fairly minimal. Generally speaking, a thinner tire is gonna do just fine. Unless you're riding a lot of sand, loose gravel, snow, that kind of thing, then obviously you want a wider tire, but that kind of stuff tends to be fairly rare on a longer tour. On a longer tour, you're probably gonna find that you spend most of your time riding on either pavement or hard pack, generally better gravel and, and dirt roads. So I find for most of the time that a fat bike is overkill for most people's needs. Obviously, if you're going on a specific trip where that's necessary, that's a different story and that might well be the best bike for you under those circumstances. So again, why the mountain bike? For me, the mountain bike is the best compromise with the exception of very deep sand or snow, something you're probably not gonna hit very often if at all on a longer tour. I find that a mountain bike like this is more than capable for any kind of terrain that I encounter. It's gonna be comfortable on really rough ground, really rough trails. And it's also plenty fast enough when I need to cover ground on pavement or smoother gravel. A lot of people assume that mountain bikes can't go fast, but if you set your bike up with fast rolling tires and a fairly aerodynamic riding position, you can absolutely cruise along at not much less than you would on a gravel bike on a mountain bike. On flat ground without wind being a problem on relatively smooth roads, I can comfortably average about 25 kilometers an hour. And I can sustain that basically all day in those circumstances, which isn't really that much slower than what I would be doing on a gravel bike. The difference is that where a mountain bike is ever so slightly slower than gravel bikes on smooth, nice gravel surfaces, which are the kind of thing that a gravel bike excels on, when it comes to the really rough stuff, a gravel bike is gonna be nowhere near as comfortable, nowhere near as capable as something like this. So for me, I'm happy to sacrifice that tiny bit of speed for the smoother stuff because it gives me a vast amount more capability when it comes to the rougher stuff. In terms of this specific bike, this is a two-terrain Outback Explore running 29 by 2.25 inch tires. This is a steel frame. A lot of people ask about frame material. Personally, I don't think it actually matters that much. Steel is nice because it's super durable and you have the added benefit of knowing that if you do break or crack your frame, you can get it welded, you can get it repaired in the field just about anywhere in the world, which is nice. The other frame materials you might be looking at are likely gonna be carbon, aluminium, or titanium. They're all perfectly feasible. A lot of people don't like the ride quality for aluminium bikes, but I haven't ridden any high-end aluminium bikes, so I can't really comment on that. Titanium is really nice in that it's very strong and it's lighter than steel, but it also does tend to have a higher fail rate. So although in theory, titanium is stronger, in practice, titanium bikes seem to crack slightly more often than steel equivalents. And carbon is obviously the lightest of the lot, which is great if you're going light, but as a downside, carbon is also much more likely to break you have to be a lot more careful with it. You do have to baby it a little bit. So on a very long tour, I would be a little bit skeptical riding carbon just because I know that I tend to throw my bike around quite a lot. It's likely to end up on the roof of a bus somewhere in South America and it could easily get damaged. So for me, steel is probably my material of choice for frames. In terms of the geometry of the bike, you wanna find something that strikes a balance between comfort over long distances and capability when it comes to technical riding. This for me hits the sweet spot. It's incredibly capable on the more technical off-road single track that I like to ride, but it's also incredibly comfortable for just grinding out miles day after day. So I absolutely love the geometry on this bike. Again, this is not really a review of this particular bike, but for what it's worth, Two Terrain absolutely nailed it with this frame. Okay, let's talk about the drivetrain because I think this is probably the most important thing you can think about when choosing your bike. So on this bike, I run a pinion gearbox, which is a gearbox built into the bottom bracket here. A lot of people do ask if it's electronic. It's not, it's fully mechanical. All of the gears are sealed in oil here in the bottom bracket. This is the Pinion C1.12 gearbox, which gives me 12 gears, a gear range of 600%, which is more than you get on a SRAM Eagle. A SRAM 1x12 Eagle drivetrain has only 500% gear range, whereas this is 600, so it's really nice to have that huge range. The other benefit of running a Pinion is that you can get away with using a Gates carbon belt drive like this one instead of a chain. The benefit of that is you don't have to worry about cleaning it, you don't have to worry about oiling it, and it should also last a little longer. On a long tour, I think it's definitely worth carrying a spare belt somewhere. They only weigh about 80 grams and they fold down pretty small, so it's worth having it taped to your frame somewhere. My first belt lasted nearly two years before finally snapping on me while I was mountain biking fully loaded in Canada and it was a 10 minute job by the trail side to just get out the new belt and attach it, change it over, and this one's running fine. So this should hopefully be good for another couple of years. 
The benefit of using something like this is that there's no maintenance to do with the gearbox. You have to change the oil once a year, which is a 10 minute job. And other than that, it works flawlessly all the time, every time. It doesn't wear out. You can use it for years on end and the shifting is incredibly smooth as well. The downside to using something like this is that it is going to be a little bit heavier than an equivalent system. It probably adds just under a kilo compared to the absolute lightest possible 1x12 drivetrain. For me, that's well worth it for the no maintenance, no fuss aspect, and also because it gives me a much higher gear range than I would have on a 1x12. I will just say that I think this thing is absolutely incredible, so if you are considering purchasing a bike with a pinion gearbox, I would massively recommend it. I would really struggle, I think, at this point to go back to a non-gearbox bicycle, just for the fact that everything works perfectly all the time. There's no maintenance, the gear range is incredible, the shifting is incredible, and it just takes a lot of the stress out of the whole travel by bike thing. Regardless of whether you run a gearbox like this or a conventional drivetrain, I think the important thing for bike packing and bike touring is to make sure that you get your gear range correct. It's very easy to work out what gear range you're gonna have with a given setup. You just have to plug the numbers into a calculator. Again, I'm gonna post a link in the description to a gear range calculator. If you put into the calculator what wheel size you're running, what tire size you're running, and what specific cogs you're running in terms of the number of teeth, that's something you can easily work out just by counting the number of teeth on the cogs that you've got on your bicycle, so that's easy to work out. If you plug those numbers into a gear ratio calculator, it will give you numbers in terms of your maximum and minimum gears. The number that I find most useful personally is to go with gear inches. It doesn't matter if you're on the metric or imperial system, it's just a unit of measurement that you can use as a guide on how low or high your gear is going to be. Personally, I think the more important number is the bottom number because I think it's really important to have a super low granny gear, a really low bottom gear for getting up the really steep hills. And especially if you're someone like me that spends a lot of time in the mountains, it's really, really key that you have a very low gear that you can just click down into and just sit there in that low gear, spin up the hill and make sure that you get there without knackering your legs too much. Personally, I think it's really important to have a bottom gear that has a range of something like 18 gear inches or less. 20 gear inches is doable, but you're going to find that on the very steep hills, it's probably not quite enough. This bike has a bottom gear with a range of 15 gear inches, which is super, super low. Basically on this bike, I can pedal up almost anything as long as I'm not losing traction or tipping over backwards. So having something with as low as 15 gear inches for your bottom gear is incredibly beneficial and it makes life so much easier. So if you can go as low as that, then that's fantastic. If not, I would say aim for at least 18, if not 20, if you can't manage 18. On the top end, it really depends on how fast you spin your legs. I have quite a high pedal cadence, so I generally don't need quite as high of a gear as maybe someone else might. This bike has a top gear of something like 96 gear inches, I believe which is enough for me to pedal up to about 45 kilometers an hour without spinning out. And that's more than enough for me. I'm very rarely pedaling faster than that. The only time I'm gonna be doing that really is downhill. And then I can happily just sit there and enjoy the free distance. Okay, let's talk a little bit about wheel sizes. This is a 29er bicycle. These are 29 by 2.25 inch tires. The question of what wheel size to go with has been around for a long time and ultimately I don't really think there's necessarily a right answer for everybody. The three wheel sizes that are generally available are going to be 26 inch, 27.5 inch and 29 inch like this one. My suggestion would be to avoid 26 inch at this point. It used to be conventional wisdom that 26 inch was the best wheel size to go around the world with just because it was likely to be the most widely available. In my experience that's definitely not the case anymore. It's very hard to find parts for 26 inch especially in the modern world. Even in more remote parts of the world like Africa, you're going to find it's actually quite difficult to find parts of 26 inches, especially good quality parts. So I would say for most of you, 27.5 or 29 is going to be the way to go. Between 27.5 and 29, I think a lot of it is going to come down to your height. If you're a shorter rider, then it makes much more sense to go with 27.5 because you're going to have less issues with clearance between the handlebars and the wheel and also between the saddle and the back wheel when you're carrying luggage on the bike. If you're a taller rider, you're going to have the choice of going with either the 29 or the 27.5. I'm about six foot, so I could go with either, but I do prefer the 29. I just find it has slightly better rollover and it's a little bit faster on smoother surfaces. The 27.5 does have the advantage of having more different tire options available. It's a little bit easier to pack up if you need to put your bike onto a bus or in a box because it's a bit smaller. And you also have the advantage of it turning faster and being a little bit lighter as well. In general, I don't think it's a big deal. I think you'd be happy with either, so just go with whatever works for you. In terms of the tire width, I've gone with 2.25 inch wide tires. 
For me, that's a good sweet spot. I've ridden both narrower tires and wider tires, and I find that this, for me, is a good compromise between comfort, traction, and speed. Personally, I don't think I would go below a two inch tire for the kind of riding that I do, just because I know I'm likely to end up on some rougher off-road, and I don't think that anything less than two inches is quite enough, really, for the kind of stuff I like to do. As for going wider, as I say, I've ridden three inch tires for quite a long time, and I do really like the extra float that it provides, but for the most part, I find it's overkill and it does add a lot of weight and rolling resistance if you have wider tires on there. So for me, something like 2.25, 2.35, something like that is a good compromise. It gives you plenty of float for the rougher stuff, but it's also pretty fast once you pump it up on pavement and smooth the gravel. While I'm talking about the tires, I think it's also worth pointing out that I run my tires tubeless. I've been running tubeless tires for at least the last five years and I honestly would never go back to running tubes in my tires. For me, it just makes a lot more sense to run tubeless. Once you set it up, they're incredibly reliable. It makes life far easier. You just never have to worry about punctures. The reliability is so good with these days that honestly, I have no worries whatsoever. For a long tour, I would still carry an inner tube and there's nothing stopping you from putting an inner tube in a tubeless tire if needed. But in practice, that's only happened to me, I think twice over the last five years that I've had to run a tube. So I'd say the reliability is really that good these days that I don't think there's any reason not to be running tubeless. There's a bit of a learning curve with the setup, but it's nowhere near as complicated as you think. So if you can run tubeless on your tires, I would say that's one of the single biggest upgrades you can make to your bike. It really does make a huge difference, and I think there's no reason not to run tubeless if you can. I would say though that the only reason I'm running 2.25 inch tires is that I do have a front suspension on this bike. I find that without front suspension, if I'm running a rigid fork without any kind of front suspension, I find 2.25 is probably a little bit too thin. I don't have quite enough cushion on it for riding rigid. So I would say if you're running a suspension fork like this, you can get away with something like 2.25 or in that range. If you're running rigid though, I would probably want a slightly wider tire for most things. If I were running this bike in rigid, I would probably be running something like 2.6 or 2.8 inches, just so that I still have the extra comfort I need for the rougher roads that I like to ride. And without the suspension fork, it's just not quite enough plush. 2.6 for me is probably the minimum I would want to go with if I were riding a rigid bike. With the suspension though, it's plenty comfortable with 2.25. I guess that brings me pretty neatly to the fork. I'm running a Fox Factory Stepcast 34 fork. This is running 100 millimeters of travel, which for me is plenty for bike packing. It's mainly there just to provide added comfort on the rougher stuff, and it does make things a lot more fun when I get onto the single track. For me, the big decision in terms of tire widths and forks is deciding between something like this, 100 millimeters of travel and 29 by 2.25 inch tire, or going with a rigid fork and a wider plus tire. If I wasn't riding this, I'd be running a rigid fork and something like a 2.28 inch tire. For now, I am still using the suspension fork because I do really like having the extra capability when it comes to single track. The suspension fork is not really needed most of the time. And to be honest, when I'm riding, it does spend a lot of its time in lockout. So I would say if you're looking at a suspension fork for bike packing, getting something that has the option to have lockout is definitely worthwhile. But when it does come to more technical single track, that is when I notice the biggest difference. The capability of a bike with a good suspension fork compared to a rigid fork and a plus tire, for me, this is far more capable and more importantly, it's just a lot more fun. I can push this bike a lot harder on the single track than I could if I were riding a rigid plus bike. So for me, it's actually worth having suspension just for the fun factor alone. That said, unless you're riding a lot of single track, it may not be worth it. I think I'd be quite happy on either. There may come a time in the next year or two when I switch from running a suspension fork and 29 by 2.25 to running a rigid fork and 27.5 by 2.8 inch tires. That's 27. 7.5 plus. The reason to switch would probably be just if I knew I was going to be riding some routes that had looser surfaces. There are some in South America where a plus tire can be handy, so it may be that I do switch over at some point in the next few years. For now though, I've been really happy with this setup. In terms of suspension forks for long-term bike packing, not a lot of people have actually tested this in terms of how much maintenance needs to be done to a suspension fork every year, especially when riding it as much as you do on your bike touring. 
I actually haven't had any problems with this. I basically just serviced my fork once a year, which would probably horrify a lot of bike mechanics, but I've not actually had any problems. I've taken good care to keep it mostly clean, except right now because I've just come off a fairly muddy ride. But in general, I haven't had any problems. It's still working pretty well after nearly a year without any kind of service, and I will be getting it serviced in the next couple of months before I get back on tour. In terms of the brakes, I run Magura MT5 hydraulic disc brakes. I switched over from mechanical to hydraulic disc brakes about two years ago when I got this bike and I haven't had a single problem. Hydraulic for me is definitely a lot better, especially on longer descents, mainly just because I don't find the same hand fatigue that I do with mechanical disc brakes. Having gone now to hydraulic disc brakes, I don't think I could ever go back to mechanical. It just works a lot better, it's a lot more comfortable. The main difference between hydraulic and mechanical disc brakes, in my experience, is not actually the stopping power. I always found mechanical disc brakes had more than enough stopping power. The difference is mainly hand fatigue. On very long, rough descents with the mechanical disc brakes, I'd find I'd often come away from it with a lot of pain and the fatigue in my hands so I'd have to stop sometimes to actually just give my hands a bit of a rest. That never really happens with hydraulic disc brakes so I'd say it's definitely worth switching over if you know you're going to be riding a lot of rough stuff. In terms of the reliability, as I say I've got these brakes bled about once a year and that's all I've done to them. I've not really worried about it beyond that and I've never had a single problem. Hydraulic disc brakes are very reliable these days so I wouldn't have too many concerns about taking hydraulic disc brakes out on a world tour. Handlebars next, obviously this is something that comes down to personal preference, so I've tried a lot of different handlebar types. My first bike had drop bars on it. Personally, I'm not such a huge fan of drop bars because I don't find them very good for technical riding and I find that they put a lot of your weight forward onto your wrists when you're going down steep, rough downhills. So I find a wide, flat bar to be the way to go. I would definitely suggest getting a bar with a bit of sweep in terms of the curvature of the bar so that it sweeps back towards you. I find it much more comfortable for long distances. I rode for more than a year with the Jones Loop H bar, which has a 45 degree sweep. For me, that was just a little bit too much. I didn't find it too comfortable. I've tried various bars at various different angles, various different degrees of sweep. And after a lot of trial and error, this is what I found works for me. This is the SQ Lab 30X bar, which has a 16 degree sweep, 780 millimeters wide, which is a pretty wide bar. That doesn't mean it's necessarily gonna work for you. This works for my body, my proportions, but ultimately I think it's a case of trial and error for figuring out what you find most comfortable. I run Ergon grips, which I find to be absolutely brilliant. The key for me with this bike, with hand positions and making this handlebar comfortable, is the additional grips which I've added onto the bike. These are little additional clip-on inner bar ends that are incredibly comfortable. They essentially mimic the position of being on the hoods if you're riding drop bars, and I find them to be by far the most comfortable hand position I've ever encountered. I absolutely love these and I'd highly recommend them. From this position, I can also still access the brakes and the shifters, which means that I can sit in that position, still have full control and be in extreme comfort. You can put these onto virtually any flat bar and they'll work just fine. Once you start getting to very swept back bars, anything over about 30 degrees, I don't think these will work as well just because the position is gonna be a little bit wrong for your hands. But if you are running a flat bar, I would totally recommend giving these a go. I do have a discount code for the spear grips. So if you'd like to try them, check the description and you'll find the discount code there. The default shifter that comes with the pinion gearbox is a grip shifter. I actually thought I'd really hate the grip shifter because I've always run trigger shifters before on my mountain bikes. But in fact, I found I absolutely love it. It's super convenient and it gives me the ability to dump all of my gears at once. With the gearbox, you can actually shift gears without pedaling, which means that if I come to a stationary, I can shift from bottom gear to top gear in the space of a couple of seconds. I've also got a lot of questions about how I wrap my bars because I have somewhat of an unusual position. The reason that I've set my bike up this way with the handlebar tape is that with the pinion grip shifter, there's a bit of a drop off that comes from the edge of the shifter down to the handlebar isn't really comfortable with the spear grips. So I wrapped it with bar tape to make it more comfortable and then did the same on the opposite end just to mirror the same position. I've also extended the bar tape slightly into the center so that I have another hand position on the inside of the bars there. One last thing to note about my handlebar setup is that I have used aero bars in the past and I do really like them for certain situations. I don't have aero bars on my bike at the moment because I won't be taking them for my next few trips. Although I do really like aero bars and I find them very comfortable, I find that most of the time they aren't necessary and they do add quite a substantial amount of weight to the bike. Generally, the only time I'm gonna bring aero bars are if I know I'm gonna be covering vast distances on relatively flat, open terrain where I'm gonna just have to cover lots of big miles on the bike. The next major trip I'm gonna be doing from Canada down through the US and into Mexico, I've decided not to bring the aero bars. We'll see whether I end up missing them, but anyway, I won't be bringing them on the next trip, which is why they're not on the bike at the moment. 
Okay, so almost done. If we talk about the saddle, the saddle that I'm running is a Brooks B17 narrow carved leather saddle. I've tried so many saddles over the last few years and I still haven't found anything that's more comfortable than this. In a way, I'd prefer not to be running a leather saddle, but having tried probably 10 different saddles over the last few years to try and find a non-leather saddle that worked for me, I just haven't been able to find anything that's even close to as comfortable as this. So even though I don't love that it's leather, I still use the saddle just because it's so damn comfortable. Saddles are notoriously personal, so what works for me might well not work for you. Leather saddles have an advantage in that once you've broken them in, they do mold themselves to your anatomy, so they're more likely to be comfortable than something which is fixed. If you are looking for a saddle, then I'd say this is worth a go. For me, one thing that is really important is that I have a cutout in the saddle because I find without that, I do tend to get a certain numbness downstairs, which isn't much fun. So a cutout is really important. Unfortunately, saddles are generally just a case of trial and error. You have to try out a lot of saddles until you find something that works for you. I don't wear padded shorts either, so it's really important that I have a saddle that works and that's comfortable for days on end, even without the extra padding. And Brooks, for me, has been the one so far. Some people do ask about how I look after a leather saddle when it rains. In theory, you're supposed to protect it from the rain because rain could damage it, but actually, in my experience, that hasn't happened. I've never really worried about protecting my saddle. I've just kind of left it out in the rain when needed, and it's always been absolutely fine. They're nowhere near as delicate as people think, so I just personally don't worry about it. It's been absolutely fine. This saddle is still going strong after a couple of years, and I've never really worried about it. It's still doing great, so yeah, no stress. The seat post that I have on here is a suspension seat post. This is the Redshift Shock Stop suspension seat post. Seat posts are one of those components that I didn't think was really that important until I tried some better ones, and I would say it's worth looking at if you're looking for a decent upgrade. Suspension seat posts are pretty expensive, so it may not be worth the money to you. It just depends on your budget, obviously. If you can afford it, I would say this is the one to go with. I did try using a Cane Creek EE Silk suspension seat post for a while, and I found that one made a small difference, but not enormous. This one though, I find does make a really big difference to comfort. So I'd say this one is actually worth it. The Cane Creek I didn't find to me quite significant enough to be worth the extra cost but this does definitely make a significant difference to comfort. The big difference I find is that it just takes all the stress out of my lower back when I'm cycling, so it is definitely worth it if you can afford it. On another note, I do get asked every now and again about mud guards or fenders if you're in North America. I don't usually run mud guards when I'm on tour just because I find that although they help protect you from water spray, they can actually cause more problems than they solve because mud can very easily get stuck in there, you can have clearance issues, so usually I don't tend to bother with them. Generally speaking, I tend to prefer to tour in relatively dry places, so I don't usually need to bother with mud guards too much. Lastly, we've got pedals, one of the less glamorous components on a bike. I prefer running flat pedals for bike packing just because I don't like taking a second pair of shoes and I like doing a lot of hiking off the bike so I don't want to bring clip-in shoes because I know I'll need a second pair whereas I can get away with just one pair if I go with flats. My first year of bike touring I didn't really give much importance to pedals so I just generally went with whatever cheap pedals I could find. As a consequence I think I went through four or five different sets of pedals over the year that it took me to cycle from New Zealand back to England including one pair that snapped on me in the middle of a snowstorm in Uzbekistan, causing me to have to cycle about 15 kilometers on one pedal to make it back into civilization. Which is hilarious in hindsight, but wasn't quite as funny at the time. So I would actually say pedals are something worth taking at least a little bit seriously and not necessarily going for the absolute cheapest option you can find. These are Race Face Atlas pedals, which are incredibly good, incredibly grippy. With a good pair of mountain bike shoes and pedals like these, I don't find I miss clip-in pedals at all, actually. I find I have more than enough grip, even when it's very wet. The downside to these pedals is that they're absolutely lethal on your shins when it comes to hike a bike. I've got more than a few scars from pedals like this because the pins really just love to dig into your skin, especially when you have to do hike a bike. So you do definitely need to be a little bit careful if you're running pedals as grippy as this. If you're looking for a cheaper alternative, a good pair of flat pedals that work, I would say the Race Face Chester Flats are a good choice. I was running those for about a year. They're pretty affordable and they work really well, so I'd say Definitely worth looking at those if you're looking for a cheaper option than this. I'm not sponsored by Race Face, I just reckon they make good pedals. Okay, so I think that is just about it. It is freezing cold here in England, so I am looking forward to getting inside and warming up my hands. If you did find this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you could give this video a like and let me know in the comments. Also, please subscribe and share this video with your friends. It helps me out a lot with the YouTube algorithm. There are gonna be a lot more videos coming out this year 
and subscribing is free, so why not? Okay, I'm gonna go inside and get warm, so I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you have a great rest of the day, and if you have any questions, be sure to let me know.